So they make tongue speaking a condition for salvation. They also say you have to get baptized. What are baptized to get saved? They teach baptismal regeneration. And by the way, if you baptize in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, like Jesus commanded Matthew 28, 19, that doesn't count. You've got to baptize in the name of Jesus only. Okay? And in order to get saved. Uh, Cornelius heard Peter's preaching and got saved and spoke in tongues. And then after that, Peter said, boy, we better baptize this guy. Acts chapter 10. Cornelius gets saved, and he wasn't even baptized, just like the thief on the cross. Now, with the thief on the cross, Jesus promised he would be in paradise with them before the night was out. But with the thief on the cross, they could say, well, that was before Pentecost. After, after Pentecost, things changed. They could try to jump through hoops. But the fact that even after Pentecost, Cornelius was saved and spoke in tongues uh, before he was baptized. You compare Acts 10, 44 to 48 with what Peter said about it in Acts 11, 17 through 18, that was Cornelius getting saved and speaking in tongues, and he wasn't baptized till after it. Okay? Now, now, let me say this. Two things. They'll bring up verses like Acts 2.38, which in the English often sounds like you have to be water baptized in order to be saved. And then there's a passage in Mark chapter 16. One basic rule of hermeneutics, there's many important rules of hermeneutics, the science of biblical interpretation, incredibly important principles in how to properly interpret the scripture, but one basic rule is never get in the habit of interpreting difficult, isolated passages, vague, unclear passages, when there are more clear, numerous passages that speak on the subject. And uh, you know, what the one that's Pentecostals do is what the Jehovah's Witnesses do and the Mormons do. They pull verses, isolated passages, totally out of their context and then give it a meaning that differs with the original meaning. Sometimes they, they just straight out contradict the original uh, meaning. And so what I'm saying is there are passages like John 3, 16 to 18, uh, Ephesians 2, 8, and 9. John 6, 47, truly, truly, I say to you, he who believes has eternal life. We're over and over again. Ephesians, look at Ephesians 1, 13 and 14. The, the clear passages on it, there are hundreds of passages that basically teach in different words that we are saved by God's grace alone, through faith alone, in Jesus alone. Okay? Uh, look at Ephesians 1, 13 and 14. In him, in Jesus, you also trusted after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in, in whom also, having believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession to the praise of his glory. So basically saying, once you believed, you were sealed in the Holy Spirit. The, the moment of belief, um, you uh, were saved. Um, uh, uh, Romans 2, here's, here's something that will give us a little insight. It's talking about circumcision. Look at what Paul says, Romans 2, 28 and 29. For he is not a Jew who is one outwardly, nor is circumcision that which is outward in the flesh, but he is a Jew who is one inwardly. And circumcision is that of the heart in the spirit, not the letter, not in the letter, whose praise is not from men, but from God. So, so Paul says true circumcision is spirit circumcision of the heart. Not outward circumcision of the flesh. It's the same with, with, with uh, water baptism, okay? Water baptism doesn't save. Outward cleansing of your body doesn't get you to heaven. It's the inward cleansing of the regeneration through the Holy Spirit. Titus 3, 4 to 7. It's the cleansing of your conscience, the cleansing of your heart. It's spiritual baptism. Now, early on in the church, the book of Acts was transitional. Spirit baptism came after you accepted Jesus as your Savior. Then the Holy Spirit baptized the church on the Feast of Pentecost. He postponed the baptism of the Samaritans uh, so that Peter and John could see that it's the same Spirit baptizing them. Therefore, the Samaritans are in the same church. But after that transitional period... Peter could say, this baptism now saves you, okay? Um, Jesus could differentiate. John the Baptist could differentiate. I baptize with water. He baptizes with the Holy Spirit and fire, Matthew 3.11. 1 
verse 12, he explains what he means. That Jesus will gather the wheat into his barn, but he'll take the chaff, the garbage, and burn it with unquenchable fire. So let me say this. I hope it doesn't offend anybody. Some of our Pentecostal brothers who are not one as Pentecostals, who are Pentecostals who truly believe, some of them say that we're baptized with the Holy Spirit and fire. No, it's either or. You're either baptized with the Holy Spirit, gathered in the barn, or you're baptized with fire, you're burned up with unquenchable fire. So Jesus draws a distinction. In the end, um, in the kingdom of God, you're either going to be baptized by Jesus with the Holy Spirit, this baptism now saves you, says Peter, or you're going to be baptized with the judgment of, with the fire of judgment. Okay? So what I'm saying is inward spirit baptism regenerates us, gives us the new life, and saves. If you trust in Jesus for salvation, you receive that inward baptism, that inward cleansing, that inward regeneration, that inward new birth, that spiritual rebirth that saves. Water baptism is just an outward sign that's symbolic of that. Now, having said that, let me say this, and I'm going to sound like a Baptist here. Water baptism doesn't save. That doesn't mean that water baptism is not important. Okay? Gentlemen, being nice to your wife, that doesn't save. But that doesn't mean it's not important. Okay? Um, with the church, Jesus commanded us to go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. 